So let's continue on with biodiversity. We've said that habitat loss is the major cause of the loss of biodiversity. Well, a tremendous amount of the most endangered and threatened species in the world live in forests. So let's take a look at the global forest change. And this map is just showing you a picture over five years from 2005 to 2010. And you can see that based on the legend at the right, that the nations that have lost the most forest have the darkest color. So the, the darker gray means they have lost less than 50,000 hectares per year. The yellow is a little bit more, the red even more, but the most, uh, the most loss has occurred in the maroon colored regions. So according to the map, which country or continent has lost the greatest amount of forest? Well, you can tell by looking at it that there are two really, there's Australia, and then you have South America. So Australia, much of the land in Australia is desert, and it's not really hospitable to forests. Um, but along the coast, there is a, a quite a forestry, and that forestry is in rapid decline. The main reasons are wheat production in the area, and also fire, and a rapidly expanding um, invasive uh, species, uh, weed, that is destroying the forest. South America is losing a lot of their tropical rainforest because they're cutting it down um, in order to, to do farming and cattle, like cattle. And then you'll notice in Indonesia, this area right here, there's also a tremendous loss of forest. South America is losing, not just South America, but actually all of the nation's forests are deteriorating at a rate of about 8.7 million acres of forest annually. So we are losing that much forest annually. Now on the other hand, you can look that some countries are having a net gain. So the light gray is a net gain of 50,000 to 250,000 hectares per year of forest. And then you've got green, and then you've got the darkest color, a dark green of all. So according to this map, it looks like that the, the country that has the greatest net increase in forest cover is China. And that actually is a, a purposeful attempt by the Chinese government to increase their forest cover. You'll also notice that in the U.S., the entire U.S. has also has an increase um, in forest cover. So a couple of fun forest facts. Which country has the greatest percentage of forest cover in the world? Well, it's actually Russia. About 45% of the land in Russia is covered by forest. Next question, which country has the largest man-made forest in the world? Well, that would be China. China uh, has, has actually planted a tremendous amount of trees and the reason that they've done this is to, st to stop desertification. So the deserts in China are expanding, um, which is partially a result of climate change and partially a result of um, practices, farming practices. And so they're purposefully planting trees to stop the continent from turning into a desert. The other reason is they are trying to fight climate change by adding more trees to absorb excess carbon dioxide. Eventually, their plan is that 42% of China's land mass will be covered by forest. Many people in the world call this the Great Green Wall <clears throat> because it is so large and ambitious in effort. Here's another question. How much of the U.S. is covered in forest? About 33%. Now, believe it or not, that 33% is actually 70% of the area that was forested when the pilgrims first arrived. So after the pilgrims arrived, um, forests were cut down at a fairly rapid rate. And so we're almost back to the amount of land that the U.S. had as forest before the pilgrims arrived, which is a great thing. So let's look at a place where there is a tremendous amount of loss of forest thus a tremendous potential to lose a large number of endangered species and decrease the biodiversity. And the case study we're going to look at is actually takes place in Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia. 
Now what's happening there is that they are burning down rainforest to plant palm trees. And you can see in the picture here, um, this boy is, is dragging along the fruit of palm trees. Um, and from this fruit, which is kind of waxy and orangey, there you can extract palm oil. Palm oil has increased greatly in products that are used around the world. You can find it in a huge number of products, for example, chocolate, shampoos, diaper cream, peanut butter, mouthwash, toilet bowl cleaner, all have palm oil. Um, palm oil has become popular because it is replacing hydrogenate, hydrogenated oils or fats. Several years ago, there was a um, people got very upset about hydrogenated oils because they have uh, an ability to increase cardiovascular disease and they were found in a lot of products. So um, palm oil is healthier and it's tasteless so you can add it to a lot of products and it kind of has this soft thick texture. Now, since the early 1990s, more than 8 million hectares of rainforests about the size of Maine have been cleared in Southeast Asia for oil palm plantations. In 2015, Indonesia's greenhouse gas emissions exceeded the U.S. due to forest cleaning and burning. So this is something that's pretty amazing to think about. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are really from the burning of fossil fuels. And the U.S. has always been number one with that. Um, Indonesia is a much, or sorry, Sumatra is a much smaller planet. They have less people. But the burning or and the cutting down of the forest has generated more greenhouse gases than that produced in the U.S. Other things that happen from burning down rainforests include loss of soil. So when the, the forest is gone, the, the soil is, um, there's nothing to hold it in place. So when it rains, the topsoil erodes and washes into rivers and you lose all the nutrients in those topsoils. Water pollution is another side effect of, of cutting down the trees and burning them, air pollution. But perhaps the biggest effect is on species biodiversity. You can see in this picture, there's a, a picture of orangutan here, two orangutans. Um, these are an endangered species. The burning down of the rainforest has basically removed their habitat and resulted in the death or displacement of about 95% of all orangutans in Sumatra. So what, what is the big difference? between Indonesia's native forest versus these palm plantations, because palm plantations are trees, so isn't that not so bad? Well, let's take a look at Indonesia's native forests. And one thing that you'll notice here is that 15% of all the bird, reptile, and amphibian species on Earth are found in these rainforests, including the orangutan. In addition, the trees, because they're so tall, help trap moisture that forms clouds over this forest. And this type of a forest, a cloud forest, is home to a very, very rare species. In addition, um, it also helps to tra trap rain and keep the area moist. When you deforest the areas, even planting other trees results in this particular area getting a lot less rain, which changes the climate. If you look at the soils in these forests, they're important carbon sinks, and that helps to take in all that carbon dioxide and reduce climate change. The forests also are very helpful for the people who live nearby and the animals that live within the forest. So they're a source of food, wood to build homes, a tremendous source of medicine. And lastly, intact forests do provide a lot of services. They store water, they purify water, and they prevent erosion. If you look at a palm plantation, there is only one species of tree. And there's a limited number of plants underneath it. In addition, oil plantations tend to have only half as many bird species as the, as the, the original forest that was cut down. Insect biodiversity is lower. You'll also find that arthropod abundance is less. Also, palm forests aren't as good at preventing flooding 
so they're not as good as absorbing that water. And they, they contribute towards sediment pollution and damage aquatic habitats. So you can see just based on these few differences that there is a huge decrease in biodiversity once you plant one species and you eliminate others. Now habitat alteration or habitat removal hasn't just happened in Indonesia, it's happened in almost every biome in the world. A biome is our different types of ecosystems. And you can see on the graph below that on the x-axis right here, they've list listed all the biomes in the world. On the y-axis here, they've listed the percent of habitat lost from those biomes. The maroon color here is showing the loss since the 1950s, but the orange is showing the loss between 1915 and 1990. However, if we look at look at it as a whole, you can see that the biome that has had the biggest habitat loss is the temperate black grasslands. Every single biome has suffered loss of habitat, perhaps except for the tundra. And the tundra is, is essentially permanently frozen ground. It is expected that with the thawing of the tundra, which is going to happen with climate change, we will start to see habitat loss as humans start to move up there and make use of the, of the land. Another cause of biodiversity loss is invasive species. And this means introduction of non-native species to new environments. Sometimes it's accidental, such as the zebra mussels, which were brought over accidentally within the, um, the bottom parts of the ship. And sometimes it's deliberate. We bring over food crops that are not native. For example, in New England, the gypsy moth was introduced many years ago to Massachusetts. And the hope was that they would make silk because that's what gypsy moths do. And that silk would be used. However, the gypsy moths ended up spreading across the US and defoliating everything in its path. Now, usually invasive species um, are able to spread so much because they have no natural predators, competitors, or parasites. And they end up costing billions of dollars in economic damage but they also decrease the biodiversity. Here's a couple of examples of different invasive species. Um, one that you might have seen is the European starling. Um, the European starling was introduced to New York in the, in the 1800s, and it outcompeted native birds for nesting sites. One of the most visible native birds that was outcompeted was the bluebird. And the bluebird is still around, but not as in high concentrations. The starling is now one of North America's most abundant birds. Another example is kudzu. We can see it down here. Um, kudzu is actually from J Japan. Uh, the U.S. Soil Conservation Service introduced it in the 1930s to help with erosion control. But what happens is it grows at about 100 feet in one season. And if you travel down the south, although it is now in New England also, you can see old homes and buildings completely covered with it. Another invasive species that we've had a problem with in Massachusetts is the Asian longhorn beetle. This was brought into the U.S. Um, in lumber in the 1990s, so it was a mistake. It came along with the lumber, and it burrows into wood and it kills trees. And this is so bad that in New York, Chicago, and in Massachusetts, Foresters have purposefully destroyed thousands of trees that are infected with the Asian longhorn beetle um, so to prevent its, its, uh, its spread. Another cause of biodiversity loss is pollution. For example, air pollution degrades forest ecosystems. Water pollution harms fish and amphibians. Agricultural pollution or runoff harms animals on the ground, terrestrial and aquatic species, and then oil and chemical spills harm wildlife. So let's look at one form of, of pollution, which is acid rain. And this is a good one for New England because we definitely suffer from this. Acid rain is a result of burning fossil fuels, running factories and driving cars. So as the emissions are released from burning fossil fuels, what happens is that sulfur and nitrogen mix with water 
And when that happens, you end up with sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Now what happens with these acids is they change the soil composition. Essentially, they cause the minerals to leach out of the soil. And the trees can't absorb the minerals. As a result, the number of sugar maple trees and other trees decreases. You can see a picture here on the left that shows the impact of acid rain. And it usually targets adult trees, they're the first ones to die, but then you end up with less seedlings. Now the sugar maple is just one of the trees that's impacted by acid rain. But the reason it's kind of important is that um, it is very economically valuable. In fact, it is the most economically valuable tree in North America. Um, now the reason it's so valuable is because first of all its lumber is very expensive so you can make a lot of money selling the lumber and then there's of course syrup and then the fall colors attract a lot of tourists in the spring, in the fall. Another cause of biodiversity loss is over harvesting. The most vulnerable species are usually large, like the elephant you can see over here, few in number and long lived. They also don't have a lot of offspring. The African elephant has been hunted mainly for its ivory and you can see that from the tusks in the picture here all piled up. Also the Siberian tiger, which we've mentioned earlier, is also, was hunted without rules and regulations to near extinction. And there are many other species um, that have been hunted almost or over harvested to extinction. For example, today's the oceans contain only about 10% of the large animals that they once did because of over harvesting. Another loss of uh, biodiversity loss, another cause of biodiversity loss is climate change. Um, climate change is due to the emission of greenhouse gases, um, which are caused by the burning of fossil fuels. The result of this has been an increase in the global temperature. That's at least one result of climate change. So the change in the global temperature and weather patterns, meaning where it rains, where it doesn't rain now, and the increase in frequency of extreme weather events has put a lot of stress on different species. And what's happening is that it's forcing these organisms to move. And where they're moving is northwards. So they're moving north away from the equator. And they're also moving up in altitude. So they're increasing in elevation because these are creatures that tend to live at cooler temperatures. So as the temperature warms, they're seeking out cooler areas. However, most animals and plants will not be able to compete or adapt to climate change. And that's because they cannot evolve fast enough um, to adapt. It is thought that climate change will be the biggest factor impacting biodiversity in the next century. Oops, sorry about that. When it comes to climate change, the Arctic has been particularly hard hit, and the first vertebrate species to be listed by the U.S. Endangered Species Act as threatened by climate change was the polar bear. And that was kind of a, a, a new step. Amphibians are also vanishing. And amphibians, and particularly frogs, are like the canary in the coal mine for an ecosystem. When they start to die, it's telling you that something is wrong with that ecosystem. Now, if we take a look at this graph here, you can see that the x-axis is the number of species of amphibians, and the y-axis is the cause of the loss of that species. The orange color are those species that are non-threatened, and the maroon color is those species that are threatened. And you'll notice that 
by far the greatest cause of the loss of biodiversity of these species is habitat loss. So, <clears throat> so you can see from that short video that amphibians have been around for millions of years. So this, this whole theme, the perfect storm, is that frogs and amphibians worldwide are being hit with multiple stressors. So it's not just a fungus, but it's also human impact and pollution and climate change and things like that. Okay, so from that short video, what are the other possible sources of the problems that seem to be affecting the frogs? Well, we had the, the parasite, which resulted in the multiple limbs, but then you saw that there are other things too, such as the nutrients that come from fertilizers from agriculture, medications that were flushed down the toilet and somehow got into the, the, the ponds, uh, medications, uh, which, which I already said. So uh, you can see that for amphibians, it is almost like a perfect storm. They're being hit with a lot of different things, which is leading to their decrease in number and possible extinction. So why should we care so much about biodiversity? Well, biodiversity actually provides us with a lot of benefits, and they call these ecosystem benefits. So again, we're gonna just look, watch this video. This is only three minutes, <clears throat> which shows you a little bit of an introduction to um, the values that ecosystem. So you can see from this short video that there are a lot of species that we have not even discovered and that most of the species we have found are in the rainforest in the coral reefs. Well, these species provide services for us, that we get our food from them, shelter and fuel. They also purify our air and water, detoxify waste. And so as you read these, these are all things that ecosystems and species in those ecosystems provide to us. Now, just a few examples. Um, of discovering these new species. Some of them are potential food sources, and I'll focus here on the capybara. Um, you can find, see it right here. This is the world's largest rodent. It is found in South America, uh, although it's also in zoos. You can see up here, this is a zoo actually in Massachusetts. Uh, it's kept in ranches, and it's mainly used for meat production. And what they've found is that the capybara, a raising capybara, are three times as efficient as cattle production in terms of, of raising meat. Um, the net, net cash return per acre with capybara is three times the cash return with cattle. And their pelts are used to make gloves. Um, their meat is, has a very high protein content. And eating capybara in South America is widely accepted. Other organisms provide drugs and medicines. There are, are many. These are just a few of the ones that do. You can see the autumn crocus here, which is common in New England, um, is a plant, but it also contains a chemical that is used as an anti-cancer drug. It's used um, to treat gout. If you look over here, the common foxglove, which is found in Massachusetts, produces a chemical that helps um, people who have had heart attacks. In fact, there are about 121 prescri prescription drugs sold worldwide that come from the rainforest and they come from plants. So again, species and the more species we have, biodiversity provides a lot of these services. Biodiversity also generates economic ben benefits. So nature tourism has brought a lot of money into Australia and Costa Rica and Belize. So what is nature worth? What would it cost to pay for all of the ecosystem services that we get for free from nature? And that includes minerals and fossil fuels and water. Well, it's been estimated it would cost about $44 trillion to pay for all ecosystem services. So my question for you is, do you think people would behave differently if they understood this? if they understood the value of biodiversity and what our ecosystems provide for us. Many people feel that 
organisms have their own right to exist. And so they think that is another reason why we have to preserve species. What do you think? Should conservation efforts focus on endangered species? So in 1973, the, the US government came up with the Endangered Species Act, which forbids the government and private citizens from taking actions that destroy habitats of endangered species. As of 2016, the US has 1,438 species listed as endangered or threatened, and worldwide there are many more. Now endangered species, this is a new term, are actually species that, uh, sorry, we've already talked about endangered species, but when we talk about these species, these include species that are not useful to humans. At least not directly. So the Endangered Species Act has three categories. The first is endangered, and these mean that the species is in imminent danger of extinction. So for example, many species of plants, whale, uh, whales in Massachusetts, such as the blue whale or the humpback whale, are in danger of extinction. This is the American alligator, which is also endangered. Another category is threatened, which means likely to become endangered at least locally. And an example you see here is the polar bear. Um, the polar bear's habitat is disappearing because sea ice is part of its habitat, and that is shrinking due to climate change. And then we have vulnerable, which means naturally rare or has been locally depleted by humans. And an example that I show you here, and this is a New England example, is a barn owl found in Massachusetts. So one of the problems of the Endangered Species Act is listing new species um, takes years because you need a lot of data in order to list it, uh, list it. Also, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, who reviews these applications, is limited in their funding to do the reviews. And finally, political pressure has put a lot of, um, has slowed the Endangered Species Act down quite a bit. Recently, with the new administration, um, with President Trump in, um, his administration has proposed revising the en Endangered Species Act, which would strip it of many of the provisions which protect species. So what do you think? Under what conditions would you favor an endangered species? And when would you let a species go because it was just too costly to save? In the world, we do have biodiversity hotspots. And these prioritize regions that are most important globally for biodiversity. A lot of these hotspots contain uh, endemic species. And endemic species are species found nowhere else in the world. Um, the hotspots must have lost 70% of its habitat due to humans to become a biodiversity hotspot. So there are th currently 34 global biodiversity hotspots, and you can see them in this picture. They are colored red. Um, you'll notice a lot of them are near the equator. Interestingly, two-thirds of the planet's land surface contains 50% of the world's plant species and 42% of all terrestrial vertebrate species. So you'll remember that the latitude gradient effect which is as you get closer to the gradient, you have higher biodiversity. So what this is saying is that a very small proportion of the Earth's surface contains most of the species. And these are the areas that we may want to preserve. So how do we save these species and biodiversity? Well, there are multiple approaches. Um, in some cases, they try to restore the ecosystem and remediate it. And this involves replanting, reintroducing native species, getting rid of pollution. There are many national and international laws 
aimed at preserving biodiversity, such as the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Environment, uh, the Endangered Species Act, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Another effort is to uh, capture the animals and breed them and then reintroduce them to the wild. And you'll see in the example below in the right-hand corner that they've been doing that with the California condor, which has increased their number from 22 birds to over 230. There are many plant and animal species that only exist in captivity now. Another approach is uh, to define um, areas as conservation areas for species. So clearly defined geographical regions. And you can see in this picture the percentage of protected areas by regions. And now these include national parks, wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and nature areas. Recently, a famous biologist, E.O. Wilson, has proposed setting aside half of the world's habitats to preserve 84% of all species. So what he's saying is that if we want to stop the loss of biodiversity, we need to set aside half of the Earth's habitats. And what he's said is that most of this area does not include people. So this wouldn't involve removing people from where they are. Ecotourism, again, is another benefit of biodiversity. The next couple of slides are questions or review questions which you might want to go through. 